Hello, I'm Robert J. Sawyer, and this is Supernatural Investigator. This week, we investigate the concept of reincarnation. Half of the planet's population shares the same belief, that some part of us survives death, and that reincarnation is a real possibility. You may be surprised to learn that the most compelling support does not come from the world of religious or spiritual studies, but from the world of science. Tom Harper is one of those seeking answers, and this week, he's our supernatural investigator. I've come to the point with regard to reincarnation that I think not only is it a worthy subject of, of investigation, but that the evidence strongly suggests that it may, in fact, be true. Well over 50% of the Earth's inhabitants believe uh, in some form of reincarnation. So it's, it's very widespread. And for Tom Harper, the most compelling evidence comes from the work of the late Dr. Ian Stevenson and his successor, Dr. Jim Tucker. This work began here at the University of Virginia back around 1960. Uh, Ian Stevenson was the chairman of the Department of Psychiatry. When he heard about these cases from various parts of the world of very young children who said that they remember previous lives, and he was curious enough where he decided to investigate and spent the next 40 years of his career traveling to various parts of the world. And he and his colleagues during that time, we've now collected over 2,500 cases of these young children who were making these claims. So then our task becomes trying to sort out what, what is this? What is causing kids to say this? And one way to test this is to see if what the child says actually matches a particular person who lived and died in the past. Ian Stevenson would actually go to the city, take the child with him, and in some cases, the child would point to specific places, bringing up specific dates and places and names. Of course, we can't rule out coincidence. We can pretty much rule out fraud in most cases because Dr. Stevenson was a very careful investigator he wrote in an academic style and like a lawyer, presenting the witnesses, where the evidence came from. He had subjects take lie detector tests, sign affidavits. He was so concerned that the evidence would be accepted in the scientific community. We use the term solved and unsolved. And solved means that a previous person has been identified whose life matches the statements that the child made. Of the 2,500, uh, it's probably roughly 50-50 the ones that have been solved versus not solved. Even to his dying day in, in 2007, he never claimed to the scientific world, I have got the ironclad proof. Remember, he had that skeptical spirit. Nevertheless, that someone as careful as he was so strongly uh, um, moved towards the possibility is, to me, uh, a fairly powerful argument. James Leininger was a little boy in Louisiana who uh, began saying that his plane had crashed, that he had been shot down by the Japanese. He gave some very specific details. In fact, um, that this was when he was two. His parents were able to ask him questions about these horrific nightmares he had about a plane crash. And he was able to say that he had been shot down by the Japanese and that his plane had flown from the Natoma is what he named the boat that his plane had taken off of. In addition, the, the boy later saw a picture of Iwo Jima and said that was where he was shot down. Also, it began saying that uh, he was the third James. When his dad searched online, um, he eventually found that there was the USS Natoma Bay. The Natoma Bay was involved in the Iwo Jima operation. There was one pilot from the Natoma that was killed in, in Iwo Jima and his name was James Houston, Jr. Uh, so James Leininger would be the third James after the, the junior. 
Another detail that James gave was that he had a friend named Jack Larson, and it turned out that there was another pilot on the Natoma named Jack Larson. The child was talking about a past life from more than 50 years before, which is unusual in our cases. So there was seemingly no way that he could have known the details that he came up with. His father was an evangelical Christian who was totally resistant to reincarnation. But his son gave out so much information about World War II, they, they said, you know, he could not have learned this watching Sesame Street. I salute you. I think that what reincarnates, uh, as far as one can tell from all the literature and so on, is the, the essential self. When I was about two years old, I told my mother that my name was not really Barbro. It was Anna. Barbara was born in 1954 in uh, Sweden to a Christian family. And they had no idea who Anne Frank was because the diary of Anne Frank had not yet been translated in, and published in Sweden. I know my name was Anna Frank, but they insist calling me on Barbro. And my parents insisted me to call them mom and pa. And I knew they were not my real parents. Well, her parents thought this was all fantasy uh, until uh, something happened when she was 10 years old. By this time, the parents knew who Anne Frank, the historic figure, was. And they went on a tour of European cities, including Amsterdam, where the Anne Frank house is located. We were at the hotel room, and my father said, that let's do the Anne Frank house first. So I called for a cab. And I found myself saying to them, we don't need a cab, we're not far away. And I knew exactly where we were. And her parents said, how could you know? You've never been here. And she said, well, I know, let me show you. And she took him by the hand and, and led him on a 10 minute walk through the winding streets of Amsterdam directly to the Anne Frank house. And then when we came up towards the house, I saw that the steps outside were different, were changed. So I stopped and I said, it's strange, they have changed those steps. When I came into that house, it was the most horrifying feeling I have ever had. Because all of a sudden I was back to my dreams. I recognized everything I had seen ever since I was a little child. And Barbara looked at a wall uh, in a room where Anne had spent time. And she said to her, mo her mother, look, uh, the, the pictures of the movie stars are still on the wall. I saw all these pictures from newspaper magazines that was cut out. And it was from movie stars and song stars and things. And I said to my mother, look, the pictures are still there. And it was like almost coming home. And she said, what pictures? And she looked on the wall and I looked on the wall and there were no pictures there. She got confused, started to cry, and the mother said, well, let's ask the tour guide. And the tour guide said, yes, indeed, the photos that Anne Frank had clipped are normally on that wall, but we took them down because people were touching them, taking them. Uh, we're going to put them under glass and then, then put them back. And her parents at that point realized uh, she was not having fantasies, that she was having memories of a past lifetime. Barbara not only had the memories, she also replicated the talent of Anne Frank and was a child prodigy writer. It was everything from poetry to little stories, thoughts about the higher power, reincarnation, where we came from, where we were going, but nothing that I had memories from being Anne Frank or anything because I had decided not to talk about it anymore. And Barbara had her first book published at age 12. And she had another eight or nine books published in her teenage years. And her first book became the best-selling prose book in Swedish history. And guess what? Barbro has the same face as Anne Frank. Uh, there's certainly evidence from our cases that there can be these memories from past lives that, that are in children. Uh, now, evidence is not the same thing as proof, but there's no question that there is empirical evidence for it. <laughs> 